Welcome to RTL Audio Lab. This is Isaac, and in this video we will go over the architecture of an FPGA audio processor. We will start by describing the audio related components available on the setboard. We will then discuss the top level components of our RTL design and the clocking architecture. After that, we will talk about the non audio and audio I.O., as well as the physical constraints that we need to add to our design. Finally, we will see how it all comes together in our Vivado project. For this project, we will be using the SYNC 7 Series FPGA from Silinx as our target device. Our development board will be the set board from Avnet, which includes all the peripherals that we need for audio processing. The set board has an audio codec from analog devices, as well as connectors for line in, mic in, line out, and headphone out. From this, we will only use the line in and line out to get analog audio in and out of the board. We will also use the buttons and switches to provide user input to our design, as well as the LEDs for visual feedback. Let's take a look at the modules in our design's top level. The design will be entirely RTL based, so we won't be using the A9 processor on the Zinc for now. There are four major components in our audio processor. The debouncer, the clock generator, the SPI controller, and the audio processor. We will explore each component in detail in upcoming videos, for now, we will focus on the clock architecture, top-level I.O., and constraints. Our audio processor uses the setboard's built-in oscillator, which is connected directly to the programmable logic. This clock is used to drive the internal logic in the design and to generate the master clock signal that will be sent to the audio codec. The buttons and switches on the setboard are mapped to the top-level I.O. signals in our design. They are routed into the debouncer module which generates bounce-free signals that we can safely use as input to our logic. The LEDs are used to provide real-time visual feedback on the audio processing and analysis done in our logic, so they are connected directly to the audio processor core. The audio codec has two separate interfaces, one for configuration and status, and one for sending and receiving audio data. The audio codec supports I2C and SPI for configuration. The physical pins are shared between the I2C and SPI interfaces, so only one can be used each time the codec is powered on. Our design uses the SPI protocol, in which the FPGA is the boss master and the codec the slave. And thus, the top-level I.O. signals include the SPI clock, chip select and MOSI outputs, as well as the MISO input. In a similar way, the audio codec supports several interfaces for sending and receiving audio data. Our design uses the default I2S mode with a bit clock, left-right clock, one serial DAC data signal, and one serial ADC data signal. Now that we have defined our top-level logical I.O., we can map each signal to its corresponding FPGA pin. The pin names for the clock and audio-related signals can be found on the setboard hardware user guide. For the switches, buttons, and LEDs, the names are written directly on the PCB, which makes the mapping even easier. Now we're in Vivado, where we have already created our RTL project. When creating the project, we can select a target board, in this case, the set board. That way, the correct target device is automatically selected and the board presets are loaded. At this stage, we only have three input files, the design's top level, the synthesis constraints, and the implementation constraints. The FPGA processor top module doesn't contain any logic, it only defines the top-level I.O. and instantiates the four top-level modules we introduced earlier. The synthesis constraints file only includes the clock definition constraint for our system clock. Silinx indicates that the Vivado synthesis is timing aware and thus recommends defining our clock signals before synthesizing the design. The implementation constraints file includes the location and I.O. standard constraints for our I.O. signals. As you can see, all the ports in our design operate on 3.3 volts, and the constraints follow the same pattern for each signal, where we select the voltage level and the physical pin to which the signal will be connected. So that's it for the top-level description of our audio processor. If you would like to know more about this project, you can go to rtlaudiolab.com, where you can find sources and project files to try it for yourself. In the next video, we will take a closer look at the first out of the four major components we introduced today, the debouncer. Bye for now.